so I'm going to take this a bit different approach than Jean-Baptiste. Uh, it's true that things are going down, but they're not disappearing. Um, this year has been an uh, incredible year for visible public API bridges. Um, you're going to hear about you know, the big ones where 100 million, 500 million, 50 million accounts are being stolen, basically, for many different reasons. Um, and what I wanted to talk about to you today is uh, why is this, this happening? Because we know about this. You, you guys all know about OWASP. That's what Jean-Baptiste said before. And we know the rules. We know what we should do. We know what has to be done. And yet, we don't. And we don't. Why? Because we're humans, right? The, the weak link <laughs> in security here. We know all the principles, we have all the tools, but we don't really apply and use them. So that's one first problem. Not much we can do about that, right? That's what we are. But it's something we can do about. And one thing we can do about is we tend to forget. So let's see. Who in the room is from the development side of the enterprise? You guys are developers mainly. Okay. How many people from security do we have here? A few. Okay, fantastic. So you guys need to be friends. That's the main problem, right? And the main problem is what's going on in development is not that you're not friends and go to coffee together or something. The problem is, um, well, there's a pressure um, put on top of development for delivering for yesterday. And what basically counts is business functionality. And if it works, then it works, right? So we tend to forget about, uh oh, you know, we're going to expose some stuff, some maybe sensitive data. Are the security guys happy with that? Like, we're not going to tell them. They're going to block everything. You know, it's going to be complicated. Uh, it takes a lot of time. We're not going to make the dates. Whatever. You know, there's a whole bunch of different excuses for this, right? So we have to change that a bit. And and, and one of the key issues and one of the reasons we created our company is. Security is hard. It is complicated. There's a lot of stuff that can happen and can go potentially can go wrong. And you have to have a lot of knowledge to make it go right. Okay? So we also have to make an effort on, on the vendor side to actually make things easier for you. The things that Jean-Baptiste and, and ourselves are actually doing. Right? But there's a lot of stuff that you can do. So this is not about tool. What I'm going to tell you are more like recommendations. I'm not going to tell you how you have to implement this. It's more the what than the how. Okay? So the first thing is this. Kill calm, trust none, okay? What does that mean? It means basically, I don't care if, you know, your APIs are what you think is public. So let's first talk about this. Public means it's on the public internet. Public does not mean you helped. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so public does not mean I did not advertise it in uh, a development portal, right? When you advertise something in a development portal, it makes it open. It doesn't make it, well, it's also public. But what really matters is, is, is this endpoint somewhere live on the internet? And if it is, it is public, okay? So Excuses like, oh, but this is my mobile application, and my mobile application only calls my APIs, and nobody will know. Uh-uh. Okay? Not working. If this API is actually only used by, you know, my friend Joe, who sits, like, next to me, and that's okay, no, not good either, right? Because Joe's computer could be compromised, and you cannot trust that. So the whole point is, whichever piece of data you receive, whatever it is, Query parameters, verbs, JSON, XML, tokens, whatever it is, no trust, okay? Wherever they come from. That's the first rule. I don't like it either. I'm not a security person at heart, but that's the way it has to be, <laughs> okay? Now, you cannot protect what you don't know. That's also something that I see a lot at customers. They keep de discovering those rogue things that are popped up like mushrooms all over the enterprise and are being used in real stuff. Um, as an extreme story, I went to a conference in the US a few weeks ago where a gentleman who worked in, um, 
in a uh, university told me the only way I found if a machine that has some stuff running is actually used or not, is I go and I unplug them from the network one by one. And then I wait for somebody to come and shout. Right? And if they do, and then I tell them what was on that machine. Okay? That's, <laughs> that's the situation. That's going to be the extreme. But without going so far, the first step is, okay, what do you have? And more importantly, those APIs that you're opening, what do they do? Are they sensitive in what they do? Are they sensitive in the data they manipulate? Because there's not one size fits all here. Security needs to be adapted in, you know, depending on what your API is actually doing. Right? If you take an open banking example, in the open banking you have open uh, APIs which are like, get, give me the list of branches or the type of credit cards that a bank can provide. Okay. That's not sensitive data and it's only a get. So probably the security on that, actually many banks in the UK have zero security on this. There's no authentication. Absolutely nothing. Now, obviously, if you take the same open banking standard and you look at the payment API, that's a whole different story, right? How you're going to basically secure that and, and, and the tokens and all kinds of measures to making sure the tokens are not stolen, etc., etc. So you need to know that. You need to know to have that profile uh, of your APIs to be able then to define what security you're going to need, right? Then the second thing is... Again, back to this trust, right? Trust known. So whatever is coming your way and coming out, that's very important, right, from an API, needs to be validated. I don't care how, if you do it in the code, if you use tools, you know, but the thing is you cannot blindly trust the information that comes your way, even if, I repeat, you think this is only coming from your own mobile application. Applications are getting, you know, scrapped, they're being replaced by fake ones, there's all kind of stuff that can happen here. So everything that comes your way, you know, you have to validate. Like, I'm expecting a get on slash foo, why am I getting a delete? That's not right, I don't want that. Reject it, right? Format of the data. Be as precise as possible in the format of the information that you're actually expecting. And importantly as well, uh, validate the output. So this is also something people tend to forget. Okay, I'm validating a thing coming in, which is like where the bad stuff is going to come in, right? Or the bad request or somebody exfiltrating data. But if somebody decided to get in and they got in and they're trying to get information out, you also want to validate the data coming out to see if it fits something that should go out, right? Or, you know, there's, there's all tons of stories, um, for example, I'll give you one. Uh, there is a bank that got hacked, actually not really hacked because it was done by a student uh, two years ago. And one of the problems that the students found is, um, so that bank, maybe you're going to recognize it uh, if you are from that bank. When you get their credit card, on that credit card there is a unique number. Um, which is like a master ID, if you want, that you need to know to do any kind of operations with that bank, right? And normally, because it's written on your card, you're the only person that should be able to know this, obviously. So what they <laughs> discovered doing the, the hacking of the system was that in absolutely every transaction call through the API from the mobile application of the bank, that super secret ID was returned in the response. So the developer didn't care, they say, well, nobody's going to see this, right? So obviously that number doesn't show up on the application. It doesn't show up on the mobile app, right? But it's so easy to just take the APK, decompile it, see all the calls, and then start playing with the API directly, which is what they did. And then they got, you know, their hands on that number and then, you know, hell break loose after that because they could do whatever they wanted. They took over the account, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So that's the kind of stuff you want to validate on the way out. That's a very good example of that, right? Uh, and the other one is also very important, exceptions, right? You have to prove that your API behaves well, whatever bad stuff is sent to it. If I'm sending a Boolean instead of an int to your calls, what is your API going to do? Is it going to behave nicely or is it going to send me this really nice exception saying, telling me absolutely everything about things I shouldn't know about, which is how that API actually was implemented, right? Because then, you know, 
Hacking is kind of a, is, is, I don't know how to say this in English. It's like uh, pulling from one string and, and see, okay, taking a piece of data, analyzing it. Oh, I learned that, so I'm going to do next. So this is Equifax. Equifax. I go and call. I realize this is Apache Struts version, whatever, which has CV1234. Then I go somewhere called Meta Exploit. I exploit this thing, and off we go. We don't even have to be smart. Right? You just have to know where to find the information. So you also have to be very careful about this. Um, and this rules against data dictionary, I'm, I'm spend a second on this because it is very important as well. Uh, this actually was given to me by a customer who's done this. It was a lot of effort, but it's really worthwhile to them, which is to absolutely define every piece of data that goes in and goes out of their APIs in a separate data dictionary and define there, this is what this data is, this is the format, this is what I'm expecting. And then the developers basically, if they try to use something else outside the dictionary, it will not work. Right? And it allows them to absolutely validate everything in and out uh, externally. And there's a new day piece of data an API needs. They add it to the dictionary. It comes out you know, as part of the things people can reuse. Um, and if it has to evolve to a new format or whatever it is, it's one place to change it, nothing in, in the code, and all works. And it's a great idea. It takes you know, a bit of work to implement, but it's extremely agile once you have it in place. And as part of your contract, so we talked about the contract more like the pure contract of the API, but as part of your contract, you have some kind of key token, something that you also are receiving. So there's tons of problems, actually this Facebook thing is, is, um, is related to that, right? It's about not validating, uh, there's been a very recent also attack on this. If that token gets stolen, how do you make sure that it's actually not something, or somebody has not replaced your token by another one. Uh, how can this happen? Very easily. Usually in, in most code I've seen validating tokens, you validate the signature, right? Maybe you look at the expiration date, and we're gonna stop there, right? In 80% of cases. Now what can happen here? I can create another token, perfectly valid. I can sign it, right? So the signature will be perfectly valid. No problem, right? except maybe I'm not using the right algorithm or whatever it is, right? So you have to really treat it. This is contract as well. If you have defined that your token has to be signed you know, with such and such algorithm, it has to contain all those claims and it has to have an expiration date and it has to have an audience and it has to have, there's all kind of mandatory stuff and you can add to that list. Every time you receive a token, you look at everything everything that's in there, just to make sure that this is the proper token that you're actually expecting, right? So that's, there's actually an entire standard on this now. There's a, <laughs> a, a standard on how to properly validating a token. Should it be that complex? No, I agree. But the reality is there's been so many attacks related to this now that they had to write best practices on how to validate tokens. So there's an entire bunch of things on that. I also wrote an article on this uh, that you can find on our uh, website that gives you more, more information on all this, right? And, and one thing which is very important as well, remember that the token, like an access token generated by OAuth, is not about authentication, right? This is very critical. It is not a proof of who the person who's calling you is. It means that at some point, this token has been legally <laughs> you know, uh, obtained, but if, you know, think of it as an hotel card, right? If, if you go to a hotel, you register, you have to prove who you are, and they will give you the key of your hotel room. Once you have that key, you can give it to your colleague to go and fetch something in your room, the door will open, because the key is valid, right? So, OAuth is not about authentication, right? It's about authorizing somebody to access a resource. So it is not a proof of who you are. So you have to remember that and not use that as a proof of who the person is. It's not an authentication proof. If we want authentication, this is OpenID Connect. It's not the pure OAuth uh, on top of that, right? And, um, and finally, um, they had something in there. No, algorithm, I said, okay, fine. Uh, yeah, finally, the, the, the signatures, if you can avoid shared secrets, as always, if you have a shared secret, then you have to share it, which means at some point in time, the two parties need to exchange that information, which is a point also of, uh, of security, which is important. So you have to be careful about that. Yeah. 
Okay? Um, now, again on authorization. Okay, I have a token, so I validated that everything that comes in is valid, it's all good, I'm good, okay? I received a token, some key, I validated it, it's all good as well. Okay, cool. Now I want to validate that the whoever is calling me is actually authorized to do this. So how many of you here are using scopes to do some kind of authorization levels, right? Okay, how do you find that in terms of granularity of what you can express? Right? Why is that? Because what a scope says, it says that specific operation, basically, is uh, authorized. As a user who has that scope, I can basically, I am authorized to call that specific operation, right? So this is very coarse grain. It's the first beginning. But for example, what if, that's another attack, right, uh, on a mobile uh, provider in the US. So what they did is you have a token, right? So I register on their website, I get the token officially for their API, and then through the API, basically, I can go and fetch information on my phone number, right? So if I'm calling the API with my phone number, then okay, I get some information by my phone number. But the trick is, I can also use the same token, which I obtain absolutely legally, to get the information on another phone number. Well, I'm not allowed to do that. That phone number is not mine, right? But because I'm authorized to call that specific operation, I can pass it whatever information I want. So after six hours of a bot going one, two, three, one, two, three, five, one, two, three, one, four, three, seven, one, two, three, one, four, three, eight, and trying phone number after phone number after phone number to see how many records they could get, then they got a few millions, okay? So the key problem there is authorization. I am not authorized, even if my token is legal, I am not authorized to get the information for somebody else. So you need to enforce that somewhere. You need to have some rules on protecting yourself from the fact that somebody cannot access data that is not, you know, they have, don't have no right to access, right? And scopes don't allow you to actually express this kind of thing. So how can you do it? Uh, probably using something at an ABAC solution, attribute-based authentication solution, which basically allows you to express some rules that will give you this, um, this type of, um, of enforcement, I would say, right? Um, and finally, um, I would say my fifth thing would, would be to really, you know, in line with Jean-Baptiste was saying, also is to automate security. You know, we're in this crazy world now where we have to generate those APIs like crazy and they have to be, you know, there's a new version coming out every week, et cetera, et cetera. If you have to do all of the things that I said, which you have to do manually, you're not going to do it, right? It needs to be part of the development flow and it needs to be automated in a way that you just publish your code and some magic happens and you get a report and somebody tells you, yeah, this is fine, this is not fine. So you have to automatically and continuously test your code, test your APIs to see if they are actually happy, you know? Uh, so that's what I call the hacky path instead of the happy path. We tend to <laughs> focus on the happy path. So I would like you guys to focus on the hacky path, which is to test how your API behaves outside of the happy path, right? So what happens if you send all kind of bad stuff to it? Is it happy about it? Is it responding properly, et cetera, et cetera? That's one of the things you actually want to do, right? Um, you probably want to do some chaos engineering, which is basically a concept uh, of, you know, killing stuff randomly <laughs> and see how the system answers to it, right? So in this world of microservices, and deep relationship between many different objects which are having all their own lives, which frankly scares me. Um, this is even more uh, in important to use, right? Because if, if one thing, for example, is very simple, you attack an API, it, it generates a lot of problems, right? So it starts filling the logs. Maybe you're reading the logs automatically and it pushes them to Elasticsearch right, or pushes them to somewhere else. So by just clicking and sending data inside the system, maybe I can just get the whole, not only the API, but everything that's behind to actually fall, yeah. Okay, so you have to be also careful and do all that testing, but in a continuous fashion, right? That's, that's where you have to work with your um, 
with your ops. And the first one here, so who here is using uh, Node.js? A few of you, okay. Um, so this is also something you have to do. You have to be very careful. This is an angle of attack. I'm going to explain this more in details. I have more time in, in the workshop after. But this is an angle of attack which is super easy to just put in there uh, a fake, uh, either a fake package, right? Or simply take an existing package which is used by plenty of people in the Node.js community and insert some bad code into it, right? So now you have an entry point and malicious code running automatically in hundreds and thousands of applications ar uh, around the world effortlessly. You don't have to even inject the code. They come and they get it themselves, which is like a, <laughs> a dream for a hacker, right? That's, that's kind of crazy. So you have to be very careful here. Uh, there are tools out there. There's a tool called Snike, or Snake, I pronounce this, but Snike, which is actually very good, that will look at your dependencies and cross-check with uh, a vulnerability database. And if you're using GitHub, there is a dependency graph that you can turn on that will also detect this type of stuff. Because it will have to walk the entire tree of your dependencies to find this pro those problems, okay? So be careful about this stuff. And of course, monitor and raise alert on all this. And I'm finishing now. Um, so if they're leaving, they won't get the gift. That's okay, no problem. Uh, what is the number one, so I have something to win here, one person. What is the number one, so they're not living anymore, see. Uh, what is the number one source of secrets leaking in our development world? GitHub, you said it first, yes. GitHub, number one. And remember, if you remove it, it's not gone. You have to clean all your history as well. This is where all the AWS secrets are, it's where all the secret keys from OAuth are, this is where all the passwords are. You know, so you have to be very careful about this. And that's what I had to, for you today. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing you. Better.